We're out of time to invent electric ways to do manufacturing, to invent batteries for trucks. Um, energy transitions take a century or more. Uh, consider it took 50 years for oil to be just 10% of the energy we use. It took 70 years for natural gas to provide just 20% of the energy we use. And therefore, whatever solutions happen in the future already need to be commercial. We don't have time left to come up uh, with alternatives. Welcome everyone. Biodiversity for a Livable Climate and GBH Forum Network bring you a monthly lecture series titled Life Saves the Planet. This month, our featured speaker is Alice Friedemann, a systems engineer who decided to put her considerable knowledge and talents into the task of examining what the alternative energy sources that have been suggested as fossil fuel replacements can really be counted on to accomplish. Her most recent book, Life After Fossil Fuels, a reality check on alternative energy, is the basis for her presentation and for her conversation today with Adam Sachs, Executive Director of Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. And before we go further, I want to thank Alice profoundly for taking a hard look into the future where we will face diminishing fossil fuels and rapidly accelerating heat and other climate impacts. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Alice Friedemann and to Adam Sachs. Thank you, Paula. And uh, I just can't express my enthusiasm at, at this particular event uh, because Alice has opened my eyes to a great deal of uh, information that I thought would be true, but I had no basis for it in any kind of research that I had seen. So Alice, um, just as a brief introduction, I'd like to say that biodiversity for a livable climate and your work have faced a similar fundamental challenge. We are questioning basic cultural beliefs that drive many decisions from personal to political, local to global. In the case of Bio for Climate, we confront the climate mainstream's assertion that global warming is primarily a result of elevated greenhouse gases from burning of fossil fuels. We agree that fossil fuels create greenhouse gases which trap heat in the atmosphere and ultimately on land and in oceans. And for many reasons, greenhouse gases need to stop. But it also begs the question of where does all that heat come from? We at Bio for Climate maintain that the root cause of climate disruption is the destruction of ecosystems, to put it simply, leaving bare land that gets hot because it's unable to absorb water or cool the environment through green plants by evaporation and transpiration. From this perspective, the solutions are clear. Restore billions of acres of devastated lands, manage the lands and waters to save biodiversity and cool the biosphere. Along the way, we must also end the burning of fossil fuels as immediately as possible. But there are consequences. Billions of people currently rely on fossil fuels for just about everything. How do we turn off the spigot? How do we react as the spigot turns itself off? That's what you've been focusing on. Thus, Energy Skeptic and Bio for Climate are in a similar position, challenging desperately held beliefs that have overwhelming general agreement around the world as we watch aghast because we have discovered that these beliefs are disastrously wrong. These are tough things to walk into a room and tell people. So to start off, uh, do you wanna say something about how you found yourself on this path during a successful career as a systems engineer? Well, I'd have to say that my career as a systems engineer, especially at American President Lines for over two decades, uh, prepared me well to understand how complex the energy issues, ecology, biodiversity, and so on were. Uh, we shipped uh, to dozens of nations globally, 
not only on ships, but rail and trucks, just in time. So you had to work out, well, there's thousands of routes, which is fastest. There's 75 legal documents between the shipper and the consignee. There's the tariff system man manifest for each country, dangerous and hazardous cargo. I, I could go on for 20 minutes. On top of that, each ship is a Rubik's cube with up to 20,000 containers stacked 14 to 21 high. And you'd better not put the one getting off at the next port on the bottom of it. So when I did a project there, I had to do come up with how it would be done A to Z so that I could know how much it would cost, how long it would take, and how many staff would be needed. And now and then there was what I call a showstopper. The data wasn't available and couldn't be made available. Or the cost was so high it wouldn't be profitable, which I think is directly comparable to energy return on energy invested. You don't want to use more fossil fuel energy to create ethanol than what is contained in the ethanol. So I'd say energy and climate, a walk in the park. And let me give you an example uh, within transportation, which is the number one problem to be solved, because if you can't electrify um, or run transportation on, on something besides petroleum, um, everything stops. Um, for instance, when I um, was, was looking up what would happen if trucks stopped running, I found three studies in America, Britain, and Sweden that looked at what happened when there were truck strikes. And within a few days, grocery store shelves emptied, gas stations ran out of gas, pharmacies, hospitals, and factories ran out of supplies within a week. So it wouldn't take long for civilization to end. And that's not the only kind of um, truck we depend on. There's the tractors and harvesters that plant and harvest crops, mining, logging, construction, fire, garbage, um, and dozens more. So then the next question logically is, okay, so what, what do trucks, locomotives, and ships run on? And it, the, the, the big guys almost exclusively run on diesel with engines exquisitely crafted for over a hundred years to only run on diesel that are twice as efficient as gasoline engines and can last for 40 years. They cannot run on um, natural gas, gasoline, kerosene, which is jet fuel, um, ethanol or diesel haul. So it would seem, well, you know, if, if oil gets tight, let's give the entire barrel to diesel trucks. But unfortunately, only 10 to 15% of a typical crude oil barrel um, has the diesel fraction within it. And there's about 60 other fractions, uh, like the kerosene for uh, jets and the gasoline for cars that can't be converted to diesel. So that leads you to ask, well, what could replace diesel? And ideally, it would be a drop in fuel because we've invested trillions of dollars in our existing um, diesel vehicles, um, equipment engines, um, roads, uh, the distribution system of um, tens of thousands of miles of oil pipelines, and in America, 160,000 service stations. So um, the only um, drop in fuel that I could find was coal to liquids, coal is finite. World coal production may have peaked in 2013 and peaked before that in the United States. And half of our coal comes from Montana and Wyoming where there's not enough water to convert it to um, coal to liquids, not to mention the extreme pollution uh, that that would cause. Um, natural gas is also finite and you'd have to retrofit every um, truck in the country with gigantic gas cylinders and build a new distribution system of liquefied natural gas um, and each station would cost $2 million. So that's not renewable. So the renewable uh, solutions uh, proposed, the number one is batteries. Well, the batteries in electric cars don't scale up. By the time um, 
they're large enough to power a truck, it's not going to far, go far or carry much cargo. Um, and they, they take 12 hours to recharge. Um, at this point, ultra fast uh, recharging in half an hour shortens the battery life substantially. And if you did manage to do it, each one of those rechargers would use the equivalent of 4,000 homes of energy. So you would also need to be beefing up the electric grid and the distribution of these uh, machines all over the country substantially. And that doesn't answer the question of all the off-road trucks that are far from the electric grid, the logging, the mining, uh, the, the construction, uh, the tractors and harvesters have electricity in the country, but it's a very thin grid. Is there enough electricity? Um, so the only other um, option for the heavy duty transport are hydrogen fuel cells, which are very far from being commercial. Even though hydrogen fuel cells were invented 200 years ago, you must purify the source of the hydrogen, which right now is natural gas for nearly all of it because um, producing it from hydrogen would be 12 times more energy and cost. Um, and if it's not purified, it'll clog the hydrogen fuel cell. And you can't use seawater because that will emit chlorine gas. And you can't really use fresh water because that would compete with agriculture and um, cities for water. And then since hydrogen has zero energy, you need to use even more energy to um, put energy into it by compressing it or liquefying it to minus 423 Fahrenheit. And then you have to build very expensive um, container, containers and pipes that won't corrode because hydrogen corrodes steel and it will inevitably escape because it's the world's smallest element, the universe's smallest element for that matter. And kaboom, um, it's ex if it does escape, it's extremely explosive um, and the, the fires burn um, invisibly. So there you go, that's transportation. There's a lot more to be said, but I'll leave it there. Oh, okay, so uh, that kind of limits the transportation options. And of course, there are millions of people around the world who are absolutely reliant on the fossil fuels. Um, that starts to get pretty scary. But a, a little more about you. Uh, I'm curious, what is it that you did differently? Or how did you think differently to come up with these conclusions, which are so different from I would say almost everybody else that I've read who are analyzing how, how energy works in, in our, our hyper-technological society. Well, um, there's a lot that could be said, but um, when it comes to energy, I first became interested in that in the first energy crisis in 1973, when I was in college at the University of Illinois. And 5 million people went back to the land because it was very obvious to everyone then that we depended on fossil fuels for civilization. Um, there weren't wind turbines, uh, solar panels to speak of, hydrogen uh, not batteries, none of that was really uh, being thought about much. Um, but what I did was I joined an alternate technology group at the university and we watched the engineers uh, convert cars to run on methanol and batter, um, batteries, we got to build the solar collector by drinking a hell of a lot of beer and painting the cans black. So I thought saving the planet from climate change was not only going to be fun, it was going to be a party. So I stopped worrying um, until 2000 when I finally got around to reading my deceased grandfather Francis J. Pettyjohn's memoir. And he was quite a world uh, renowned geologist. He wrote many of the textbooks. When he taught at the University of Chicago, he mentored um, and taught uh, M. King Hubbard, who was the first in the 1950s to make a model of discoveries of oil. And then from that predict when peak oil production would happen. So he modeled the discoveries in the lower 48 states 
of conventional oil, which is not Canadian tar sands or fracked oil, and predicted that their production would be in 1970, which was spot on. Then he used the same model to look at world discoveries and a likely production peak and said around 2000. Well, yikes, it was 2000. So right away, I was looking up um, the Hubbard on the internet and stumbled on um, various forums um, on Yahoo groups that were talking about Hubbard's curve, uh, now known as peak oil, as well as biodiversity, climate change, limits to growth, um, many other ecological topics. And quite a few of them were explaining why renewables could not replace fossil fuels and why they were not renewable. Well, nonsense, I thought. And I went off to UC Berkeley a few miles away to do research to prove them wrong and uh, began reading up on wind and solar, hydrogen batteries and, and so on. And to my great dismay, after about half a year, uh, realized that they, that they were right and I was deeply depressed for several months by the implications. Uh, but, but then I, um, I carried on doing research. Uh, manufacturing uses half of fossil fuels. So of course I was um, interested in that. Uh, transportation of course is the most important because you can't manufacture if the supplies and parts aren't delivered to the factory. Um, but I started looking into that at UC Berkeley and only very recently in the past few years was, I, was research finally uh, being done on that. And at this point, there are no electric or hydrogen or any other processes besides fossil fuels to create cement and steel, which are the backbone of our civilization. All, there are no ways to do that right now, commercial processes. Uh, are for our roads, bridges, uh, wind, wind turbines, and solar panels. And that's because fossil fuels can generate up to 3,200 degrees Fahrenheit heat. A nuclear power plant could manage 580, geothermal 400, and so on. And you're not about to move every factory in the United States next to the few remain, remaining nuclear power plants that don't generate enough heat anyhow. Um, and even fewer geothermal plants. So another reason um, there's no electric or hydrogen or other ways is that manufacturers are totally uninterested. They're running these multi-billion dollar facilities uh, to replace blast furnaces or kilns would cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, they're they're comp competing internationally with razor thin profit margins. So if you did do some kind of carbon tax, they would just move to a country that still had um, fossil fuels. And then you're talking about uh, wind turbines replacing themselves, which they need to do if they're to be considered renewable. Well, you'd have to have tens of millions of two megawatt wind turbines. They weigh 1700 tons each. 1,300 tons of that is concrete, 300 tons of that is steel, and on top of that you have many more tons of iron, copper, and fiberglass, which is partially made out of petroleum. Um, and then, rinse and repeat, um, you'd have to make uh, wind turbines, land wind turbines every 20 years, that's their lifespan, offshore every 15 years, and solar panels every um, 18 to 25 years. In order to get, uh, scientists have calculated that in order to get the metals and other materials needed to make wind turbine, solar, et cetera, you would have to mine 37% of Earth's surface, not including Antarctica. Um, and there goes biodiversity, forests, and uh, massive pollution of ecosystems. Uh, China has taken that route, and 20% of their farmland is polluted with heavy metals. Um, even if electric methods were invented, our U.S. grid is spectacularly unsuited to using electricity 
because two thirds of the of electricity here is produced with natural gas and coal. And 66% of the energy in natural gas and coal is lost as heat in converting it to electricity and up to 10% more over the wires. So only 25% of the energy contained in the fossil fuels would reach a factory. It's three times or more energy efficient to burn the fossil fuels directly than to use electricity. The other issue with wind and solar is they're intermittent. Fact, many, many factories run around the clock. Blast furnaces for steel and iron and other metals um, and kilns for cement can run up to 20 years, 24 seven. If there's an outage, their lining breaks. Uh, chemicals and other products are heated up and flow through tight um, pipes and tanks. And if the outage, if an outage happens, they will crystallize or harden and clog up the entire factory. Um, microchips, which we depend on just as much as fossils and electricity, um, take weeks to make because they require thousands of steps. And if you have an outage, you have to throw out tens of millions of dollars worth of microchips. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's the primer on manufacturing. Uh, that uh, sounds pretty grim. Um, at, at one point, you're talking about, uh, I think it's in trucks, when trucks stop running, uh, about how uh, day by day our society essentially falls apart and how within a week we have this into chaos. Um, do, you, do you have um, a quick summary of that? Uh, well. Um. Well, I, it, 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 I, the, uh, my first book, When Trucks Stop Running, goes into the details of what the uh, three studies found about what happens if uh, trucks stopped running. Um, and one, one thing um, that's interesting to note is that um, before fossil fuels, um, water transport was the way to go. It was just uh, hundreds of times more uh, fast and efficient than land transport. And consequently, you had almost everyone living near navigable rivers, uh, lakes, and the ocean. Um, back, you know, that's, that's kind of like um, why containerization happened uh, that made global, globalization possible starting in 1956, because it became um, cheaper, faster, and easier to ship goods from Japan to Chicago than St. Louis to Chicago. Um, it's so much faster that um, and, and, and uh, cheap that today ships carry 90% of all global trade. Um, before fossil fuels, wooden ships might have 300 tons of goods. Today's container ships half a million tons that they can move five times faster than wooden sailing ships. Um, before um, containerization, it could take two weeks for hundreds of men to load and unload a ship in port. Now it can be done in hours with just a few people. So, um, but where, where does that leave us? Well, we're really in terms of on trucks because we only have 25,000 miles of navigable waterways, 95,000 miles of rail tracks, but we have 4 million miles of roads. And 80% um, of towns depend completely on trucks in America because there is no port or rail depot uh, nearby. Um, tight spot. So within, within seven days, we have to figure something else out completely. 
to uh, revive global functioning at all, and obviously that's not possible. Um, you, at, at one point, you kind of summarized the solution in, in one word, and that is would. Can you explain that about work, but how it would be nice if it did? Well, I was hoping to answer that in the end because I, uh, to reach that conclusion, you have to talk about um, other aspects of how we use fossil fuel energy. Okay. I think one important point to make is that um, climate change and peak oil are related because, um, well, and other th causes of, of uh, climate change, because if you could just reduce consumption, consumption across the board, um, that would lower climate change. We could um, reduce the speed limit to 55. We could insulate homes. All of that would help uh, climate change, biodiversity, all the ways um, that we're impacting the planet. Um, if climate change is people's main concern, then it's gonna be good news for you that the European International Energy Agency uh, stated that conventional oil peaked in 2008 and the United States Energy Information Association, both conventional and unconventional peaked in 2018. But what's important is conventional oil. That's where 90% of our oil comes from. And 60% of that comes from only 500 gigantic oil fields, most of them discovered over 50 years ago. At this point in time, 81% of oil is declining at 8% a year, which is offset by half having existing wells be maintained by pushing oil um, up to the surface with water or CO2. Consequently, the European agency sees an oil crisis by 2025, unless we fill in the gap with a tremendous amount of fracked shale oil, which appears to have peaked, um, or new projects, which can take 10 years, but they haven't been started because the price of oil is so low. And we've been using three times more oil than we have found um, in the past uh, seven years. Um, so if P and if peak oil was in 2018, which we do have to wait several years to see, especially with COVID, um, then uh, you know we're on the downslope. Um, oil is the master resource that makes all other resources possible, include you know including food, coal, and natural gas. Um, the other is the other thing about uh, climate change is the IPCC uh, projected we would be burning fossil fuels until 2400, which is one of the reasons they come up with their um, extinction level, scary hothouse earth scenarios um, of eight or more. But geologists uh, using realistic reserves of fossil fuels, running climate models, models came up with a potential uh, climate change pathway of 2.6 to 4.5, which is plenty horrible and um, will last for hundreds of years, um, but it's not um, as bad as is being portrayed in the media either. And perhaps it's even closer to 2.6 if uh, peak oil was in 2018. Um, but more importantly as well, we're out of time to invent electric ways to do manufacturing, to invent batteries for trucks, um, energy transitions take a century or more. Uh, consider it took 50 years for oil to be just 10% of the energy we use. It took 70 years for natural gas to provide just 20% of the energy we use. And therefore, whatever solutions happen in the future already need to be commercial. We don't have time left to come up uh, with alternatives. So no fusion. What about the fourth generation of, of nuclear power? Those are still 10, 20, 30 years in the future. Um, 
the reason, um, and, and uh, I guess I should address one more important way we use fossil fuels before I get into why wood. Um, natural gas keeps uh, 4 billion of us alive and um, natural gas fertilizers keep 4 billion of, of us alive. And uh, for, natural gas is a huge problem because it emits nitrous oxide with 300 times the global warming potential of CO2. Um, the only way you could replace it is with compost. Um, it's also depleting stratospheric ozone, which protects us and our crops and all plants from UVB radiation. Um, it's runoff pollutes waterways and creates dead zones. So um, natural gas uh, is essential for agriculture. It's essential for balancing the electric grid, um, for heating homes, cooking. Uh, it's not gonna replace transportation or, uh, and it's already um, used quite a bit in manufacturing. So I've, I've also ruled out hydrogen, wind, solar, fusion, nuclear power, geothermal, batteries, catenary, wave, tidal, uh, and more in my books and somewhat today. Um, that leaves us going back to the 14th century, which is when wood was the major source of thermal energy, as well as all infrastructure rather than cement and steel. Um, and biomass is renewable. Um, that's not just wood, it's uh, crops, it's shrubbery, grass, um, anything you can find that's a plant, um, algae, kelp. Uh, and I, what else could you use to replace the half million products literally made out of petroleum? That's how 7% of oil is used. Um, that's your carpets, your clothing, um, all plastics, except for a few made from, um, bio, um, from biomass today. Um, you know, your dashboard, um, everything around you probably has some petroleum in it. Um, and biomass is the most chemically similar to oil um, because after all, oil is a biofuel, but it was made by mother nature over hundreds of millions of years uh, with a recipe of 196,000 pounds of plants per gallon of oil. That's like driving 20 miles and then getting out and harvesting 40 acres of wheat to cram into your gas tank. Um, fossil fuels today, we burn 400 times more energy uh, with fossil fuels than plant growth per year. Um, and that includes ocean plankton. Nor can we grow more biomass because of soil erosion, aquifer and glacier depletion, Cities are continuing to sprawl over our best farmland. That's why they are where they are. And above all, climate change is going to reduce um, biomass production. Um, there's going to be um, massive wildfires carrying on. And with 3 billion more people expected by 2050, we're going to need crops for food, not for biofuels. Even if we wanted to grow soybeans on every acre of our cropland, and they're already growing on a quarter of our cropland. They wouldn't come close to replacing more than a few percent of the diesel fuels we use today for trucks, locomotives, and ships. Um, so, I mean, basically, we're going screaming, um, kicking all the way back to the um, Middle Ages, and I fear a dark age. And again, um, the only way we would have to preserve knowledge without an electric grid are books which are made out of biomass. And they will only last 500 years if they're in um, peak preservation climates of being dry um, and so on. I wish material scientists were working on a longer lasting solution. Um, perhaps we can um, imprint books into all our aluminum cans to preserve them, to um, make knowledge last longer. Um, so I don't, I don't see another way. And 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 you say you got undepressed. Could you? You, you that? say you got undepressed. You uh, said you got undepressed at some point. How did you tell us how you did that? Uh, first of all, I've just I've had twenty years to get used to the idea. 
Mm. Um, I'm in touch with um, scientists and researchers all over the world. Um, I think uh, I don't like uh, what we're doing to biodiversity at all. I think all the other species have a right uh, to live as well as humans. Um, we've replaced, um, there's, we're just destroying the rest of the world. Um, the, I'm excited about going back to agriculture um, in, in a simpler world. I mean, I've always enjoyed going, um, I think if you were gonna to try to um, go back in time and not panic people, you'd build more living history uh, things um, like Williamsburg. Um, I think you're not gonna read about uh, peak oil in the news um, ever because the, the German peak oil um, military study uh, said that if it did become widely known, the stock market would crash because our economic system depends on endless growth so that um, debtors can repay creditors. And if we're shrinking, um, we need a completely different economic system. Um, the New York Times only mentioned peak oil nine times over the past five years, but climate change 15,000 times. And also very little mention of biodiversity, um, soil erosion, nuclear waste, ozone depletion, and other, uh, many other existential, ba existential boundaries uh, yeah. besides climate change. Um, and so, every the scientists will come up with something, even the scientists. Will come up with something. What do you mean? Well, scientists work within a very uh, extremely narrow range of knowledge. My sister got uh, her PhD in neuropharmacology. And when she published a paper in science, she predicted maybe six other laboratories in the world might understand what they'd written. And there's very few people um, who've read widely. Um, I had the luxury of that not being a scientist. And I read um, thousands of nonfiction books walking to and from work up to 10 miles over the past 40 years. Um, and it, you know, I mean, you look at how crazy things are now with the QAnon, uh, conspiracy theories, um, the uh, United States consistently scores towards the bottom of literacy and reading math and science. So I don't um, see much hope of us uh, planning or preparing as we should um, for what lies ahead. Um, oh. <laughs> Just so that people don't go away uh, totally unhappy. Um, I, I'd like to say a little bit about what Bio for Climate uh, emphasizes in our work. So we've been dealing with climate for, been around for about eight years. And we look at the, pos the climate positive things that people are doing all around the world. And it's huge, but it never gets into the press. So we talk about La Via Campesina, which is an organization for uh, smallholder farmers in something like 87 countries where they support uh, organic agriculture and uh, women's and, and girls' educations and all kinds of what we would call progressive things. And they have a cohort of 200 million smallholder farmers around the world that are doing these things. And these things are also climate positive. And uh, a couple of months ago, we had Vijay Kumar from Andhra Pradesh talking about the farmer managed, uh, community managed uh, natural farming. And, uh, he started 25 years ago and through the work of local women, it expanded to 800,000 farmers who are now farming organically and naturally and have quadrupled their output just by using regenerative farming techniques. And then there are individuals everywhere who have started uh, with regenerative farming and permaculture and have created these landscapes 
that are full of life and biodiversity and water and lower temperatures in spite of elevated greenhouse gases. So we can do it. And oh, absolutely, we're on the same page there. Organic agriculture, we have to do it because the only yeah. way to replace natural gas fertilizer is composting. Pesticides, just like antibiotics, we're running out of. Yep. Make oil. Um, and so we need to do organic farming with biodiverse uh, plants and wild areas nearby um, to, we have to do it. I mean, yes. no we should be doing that as soon as we can. And the good news is that we know how to do it. And people all over the world have proved that it's doable. And there's more and more talk about it, but it still hasn't broken into the mainstream. And that's one of the parts of Bio for Climate's mission that is so important is to break through the, the myths about the way agriculture and and water work. I mean, look at California and, and its severe water depletion. They shouldn't be having that. They're still fighting. Like I, I rewatched Chinatown the other night. They're still fighting those old uh, turf wars over water. And, and yet they're not, a friend of mine just drove through California and she said, nobody's saving water. They're just, it's all exposed, evaporating. The, the land is crusted over. The water can't get into the soil, which is where the water needs to go. That's a big part of the floods and the flash floods and the droughts is the water can't get into the soil. It's not that hard to get water into the soil. If you poke some holes in the ground and the water falls in a hole, it's not going to run off. And we know how to do this. And we do this with regenerative farming, with um, with grazing, with proper grazing. Bad grazing ruins the land. Good grazing is a part of the evolution of grasslands. So going back to those things, it's pretty straightforward and it's really catching on. But as we see from the IPCC report, um, we don't have a whole lot of time to do this. And, and one other thing, mute. one other thing, um, about the IPCC report is that it is the physical sciences presentation of climate. It's all about everything happens because of physics and chemistry. There's no biology in there. There's no sense of how the earth is the planet of biology. Biology literally created just about everything that goes on on the surface of the earth. And when you start taking that into consideration, which climate science has failed to do over the past, however many years, since 1988 at least, when you take that into consideration, you have a universe of poss possibilities, of po positive possibilities that can lead us in a very different direction. Although we will still have to go local, we'll still have to, cut back on, you know, year-round year mangoes in the north, although who knows, maybe we'll start growing them here. <laughs> but in any case, I, I just wanted to in, inject the, the hopeful piece of it, because without that, people just kind of get bogged down and don't know what to do. So I, I just uh, want to suggest that um, we have some ideas about what to do, and it's not just us. There are other regenerative organizations. Oh, I agree. It's so frustrating. There are things in the world, and Alice has uh, a lot of this. A lot of this on her. Yeah, and you have a lot of this on, well, on energy skeptic. Org, there as are well. many groups who specialize in what we should do, which is not my specialty. I look at you know how yeah. we do in society, but there. Are, oh, there's many hopeful things out there. I, yeah. I, to be so grim i'm sorry if I oh that's okay no i think it's important to be grim about what you're grim about because if we're not we're just going to get smacked uh with no preparation so definitely keep being grim <laughs> people's questions okay so let's go to some questions um 
Paula, are you gonna? Well, Alice has several that she had in advance. Right, okay, let's go to the questions that you have in advance. Um, what about powering down um, with rationing? Okay, well, that's one of my favorite things of what we could do. Um, there were actually two energy crises in the 1970s, uh, 1973 and another one in 1979. So the Department of, Department of Energy was asked to come up with a rationing plan. Um, it's called the Standby Gasoline Rationing Plan. I have it, um, a summary at my website and, and as well as a link to the full document. Basically, it said agriculture gets whatever oil it needs off the top before anyone else gets to have oil. And way down at the bottom was the consumer and there were all kinds of rules about, you can only own one car or you know you can only get gas for one car, you can't buy several to work around it and so on. Um, I think the best book, uh, oh, and the Republicans voted it down in 1980 as a, as a way to ration. So I think whoever's in political power is gonna be important. Um, and I think Democrats are more likely to ration. Uh, but, um, the best book by far that I have discovered is written by Stan Cox. It's called Any Way You Slice It, The Past and Present, uh, the, the Past, Present and Future of Rationing. And he, he goes into the history of rationing and why we will we'll have to do it, um, hopefully, to be fair. And the ways to do it that are brilliant that um, weren't possible when the Department of Energy wrote uh, their plan. Okay, we have another question here um, about the 10 year price for oil and implications for OPEC, given that OPEC has much of the remaining conventional easy cheap oil. Well, I mean, um, Gail Tvergberg writes that um, peak oil might be uh, apparent, might actually result in low prices for oil um, because the vast majority of people can't afford to buy it. And if, they, if the price is low, then um, oil companies aren't gonna drill for it because they won't make a profit. And so that really leaves the Middle East in the catbird seat because they have something like three quarters of the remaining conventional, easy, cheap oil. That's where a lot of those gigantic oil fields I mentioned exist still. Um, and so I am working on trying to figure out the implications um, as well. I, I wish we would keep whatever oil we have in the ground uh, underground um, and buy oil from elsewhere. I, that, that's probably what we should have always done. Uh, now we're um, pretty vulnerable and reliant on foreign sources. Would drastic reduction in population change your calculations and predictions? Oh, well, that's one of my favorite solutions is family planning um, because the uh, carrying capacity of the earth without fossil fuels is uh, quite a bit lower. And I write about what that might be in my book. Um, so we definitely should have free birth control, free, easy abortion, um, tax the heck out of families with more than one child. Um, there's lots that could be done. Uh, it's not a popular it's a, it's a taboo topic at this point, so. Well, you should be used to that by now. I, I am, I used to work for Planned Parenthood and zero population growth as a volunteer. Uh, that's the, only, that's the, the number one thing uh, we could do is to have fewer children, but capitalism depends on endless growth. So they have the opposite point of view. So we have someone here has been suggesting a carbon pricing scheme at the retail level such that every product and service would have three price labels, embedded kilowatt hours and greenhouse gas emissions, as well as the standard dollars. Do you think that would be effective in moving the market? No, I don't, <laughs> sorry. Um, it, it, given if oil's declining, um, rationing's in the future, poverty's in the future, um, you add more taxes on people, one in eight Americans is already on food stamps. Um, and that's going to increase. So I, I don't see how that would matter at this point. Maybe if we'd done that, you know, decades ago. Robert Hirsch did a study in 2005 for the Department of Energy on peak oil. And he said you'd want to prepare at least 20 years ahead of time. 
And when I've spoken with him personally, he says it's more like 30. Um, and if peak oil was 2018, um, and we've been on a plateau since 2005, roughly, with only fracked shale oil saving us. Um, and and that, that's going down now. Um, I, it's a little bit late to do to try things like that. That's my we, opinion. We do have uh, a, a common delusion that technology will save us. And um, given that the source of this is technology, it's, it's kind of hard to believe, but uh, people are trying. Um, okay. Um, uh, so would, would you advocate decentralizing cities so that more people can participate in farming? Um, oh, yeah. how, how might this affect fossil fuel consumption? Well, the more localization you have and you can um, get food and everything else you need locally, um, transportation consumes 30% of petroleum. So you'd be getting, um, you know, reducing that need quite a bit as well as all the other uh, fossil fuels. Um, I, I'm worried we're going back to a feudal society because farms are now a thousand acres or more. I'd love it if the government bought farms up and redistributed the land um, to people, um, new towns were built that were uh, highly insulated homes clustered together to save heat. There's all kinds of things we could be doing if, if we just tried, if we just, did, you know, just got realistic and cried a bit and then addressed the, the actual problem. Do I get to cry now or should I put it off a few minutes? <laughs> um, there's a professor at Harvard who teaches a course on energy systems. And he says, uh, we won't run out of fossil fuels anytime soon. And if a professor at Harvard says that, well, just what can we say? Well, he's right. Um, that's how people um, dismiss peak oil. We're not running out, the but the problem does start when you're at the peak and you depend on endless growth and the amount is shrinking um, and you yeah. haven't done any preparation for it. Um, no, we're not out. We're not running out now, but if, but peak means it's time to really start paying attention and changing um, how you live and consuming a whole lot less. And it also means that it's harder to get and much more expensive to extract. And Leaving less energy for society. Yeah, so. not to mention the, the pollution that that results from uh, more extreme measures to extract it and transport it. Well, the only reason, you know, tar sands are, are proclaimed as something we can resort to, but the only reason we can get what tar sands we have is whatever natural gas is already up there. We can only get 10% of the 170 billion whatever uh, tons of it exist because we're it's more like mining than it is like drilling mm -hmm. um it takes it it's the energy i didn't go into energy return on energy invested even though that's a big topic um but basically you want something that uh returns 10 times more energy than the energy you put into it which is what fossil fuels do um they returned 100 times more at the beginning yeah so tar sands are maybe uh two to six at best and only extractable while there's natural gas still up there. Um, the Venezuelan heavy sands are pretty much like tar sands, but it's warmer, so they're slightly easier to get, um, but they're filthy and nasty and they have to be moved to refineries and it takes more energy to refine. Um, so the energy return to society is uh, very low because you spent so much energy trying to get at it and process it. Um, and it might be too low to carry on civilization if we indeed do need a, a return of 10, which several scientists have calculated um, at, that I write about in the book in more detail. Here's a question. How can we get more stories and visions of sustainable transitions and sustainable futures in popular culture? Do you have any ideas about storytelling? in contrast to the dominant visions of 
the future of either dystopias or techno fantasies and planet B solutions. By the way, I think planet B solutions are an excellent idea for people like Elon Musk and and others of that ilk. Oh my goodness, the idea of going to Mars. I mean, the, oh, the, I've, <laughs> and staying I've there. A lot. It's, it's, uh, it's sad. We should take care of our own planet. Um, well, I, I would say people have been trying to um, alert the public that are a lot smarter than me um, and write better than me and tell better stories than me, like Richard Heinberg, Walter Youngquist, Colin Campbell, um, and so on for 40 years without uh, much headway. I, I think it's just too depressing uh, for, for the news to publish. It, it's too scary. It, it public uh, believes what they want to believe, um, crazy stuff. People filter what news they get as, as human nature to be naturally optimistic um, and to not think about depressing things. So I, I don't, I, I think that when we do have an energy crisis, that'll get people's attention, but it will probably be seen as an economic problem, not an energy problem. Or an environmental problem. Uh, I would just like to <clears throat> put in uh, one final word here, a plug for a video that I watched a couple of years ago and I rewatched the night before last and then again last night called How It Ends on Netflix. If people haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it because it shows how desperately we have to defend against single points of failure. And in how it ends, suddenly all the communications in the country go down. Nobody knows what's going on, what to do, who's behind it, vague rumblings about an earthquake in, in in Southern California. And this movie was made two and a half years ago. And in it, before it happened, it depicts these incredible violent weather scenes with these dark, dramatic, lightning, thunder uh, cloudscapes and the, the wildfires and uh, all the things we're seeing now how it ends on Netflix, and I get no money from Netflix, I assure you. Um, it anticipated all of that. So just in case you're not scared enough, um, here's Paula. Well, it's not that I think I can unscare you, but um, this has been an incredibly important conversation. And I want to thank Alice for her dauntless work. I want to thank Adam for his challenging questions. And I want to thank GBH Forum Network for having the guts to put forward and support such a challenging um, and counter to the public general opinion and belief message that you're bringing us. And I like, I guess I love something you just said, and maybe it's a good way to end it. You've showed us that it's time to get realistic, cry a bit, and then get busy to address the problem. Thank you, Alice.